Well, on the bench today, we've got a pretty special one. This is a David Petersoli reproduction of a French uh, 1777 Charleville musket. And it is a nice one. Um, this is on loan to me from a friend to shoot a video and to help him uh, clean it up. It was shipped with some sort of protecting. Yeah, it's a long boy. How about that? Uh, some sort of protective schmoo all over it. You can see it's it's everywhere. It's in every little nook and cranny, which is good. Kept it from corroding at all, but we got to get all that stuff off. So we'll be taking this thing apart, but first we're going to talk about it a little bit. And this is patterned, like I said, after the 1777 uh, Charleville musket, which was made in France in the Charleville Armory. And the first the first version, I guess you could say, of a similar musket like this was made in 1728 in France. And then they made little different variations and improvements on them. And this patent was the 1777. And you can tell if you've got one, like I said, this is a reproduction, but Petersoli is very, very accurate in their reproductions. The 1777 has these finger grooves here uh, built into the trigger guard. It's got a straight frizzin. I wish I had another model to show you. I believe they were sort of curved, or rather the frizzin, the frizzin cover uh, is straight, which I guess, I mean, I am not an expert in black powder, especially flint locks, but uh, it improved the sparking made it more reliable, I guess. Uh, and then the 1777 has a little different barrel band. Um, you can look online and see what some of the earlier models looked like. But the first barrel band, slightly different. You can see your front sight is built into that barrel band. And there is no rear sight. So not exactly built for... Uh, long range precision shooting, but I'll tell you what, a 69 caliber lead ball going in about 1400 feet per second within a hundred yards, these things would do some serious devastation. Um, and you got to think about the style of uh, combat back then. Everyone lined up and marched at each other and just shot and shot. So until you ran out of guys. So this would definitely put some people on the ground. Uh, oh, one more aspect of this. It's got this, 177 uh, has got this cheek piece. You can see it's kind of convexed for your for your cheek in, in the uh, butt stock there. So that's uh, one more feature of this one. So these particular, this model the uh, would be called the year nine of the 1777. And they saw service in the Napoleonic Wars and uh, as well as the American Revolutionary War. So up until then, we were using what we had, we, we meaning Americans, um, what we had on hand, and there really was no standardization amongst most of the muskets that, that people were using, which is fine if you're out in the deer woods or shooting at squirrels, but it's not great on a battlefield. If something breaks, you have to have blacksmiths around to rebuild your parts. Uh, so we would capture brown besses from the, the British um, and use those when we could. The uh, problem with the brown bess is that they use things like this, pins, the barrel and the stock were all held together with pins. And um, you lose one of these little guys in the field, you're never gonna find it. Okay, so you take it apart to clean it and you're pretty much out of luck. So the French, being no friends to the Brits at the time, um, sent us a bunch of 1777s, and they utilized this barrel band method to keep the uh, the barrel and the stock um, uh, connected. So you could take it apart in the field and clean it much easier and not have to worry about losing those teeny tiny pins. Um, well, as many of them anyway. And uh, so this kind of became the, the standard for the... Uh, American infantry. It was also used by the Canadian militias in the War of 1812. And after that, we uh, 
patterned our, if you have an 1816 Springfield musket, American musket, the U.S. Army Infantry standard issue, very similar to the 1777. I mean, we borrowed heavily in the design of that thing, and I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it, uh, was the, the credo there. But um, it's a pretty cool rifle. Well, that's not a rifle, is it? Because the barrel isn't rifled, it's smooth bore. Maybe we'll take the bore scope down and I can show you what that is. We'll take a look inside anyway. I'll probably need to clean it pretty in depth. Um, but it's a sweet replica of a very important firearm in history. And it's just gorgeous. Uh, I thought at first maybe it was made of stainless. Um, but I, it's not. I, I can put a magnet on it here and show you. Right, hangs on pretty strong. Also, these must be nickel plated, these bands. Um, pretty much everything on it is magnetic. So it's just steel uh, left and bright. So you would need to really make sure um, you keep this thing oiled, which is probably why it's got this grease or what have you on. And in fact, that might be what we do. I've got some Tetra gun grease. Maybe we'll grease all of these and then wipe it, leave a super thin layer on it rather than oil, but I mean, back then, what did you have? You had like tallow and bear grease, who knows what, whatever you could, chicken grease from your dinner, whatever you could get your hands on to keep your your rifle oiled up and keep it from rusting. I keep saying rifle, forgive me. I know it's a uh, it's a musket, but, oh, well, here's another interesting feature of the, the Pedersoli. It's got the uh, Saint Etienne Armory um, stamps in, on the breech as well as uh, on the lock plate, which is pretty cool touch. That's historically, would have been historically accurate. Um, that was one of the armories that made these pieces. Let's get into it. All right, we'll start with the front barrel band. And you can see we've got a, uh, well, let's get our ramrod out of there first. just keeps on coming out of there yeah 44 and a half inch barrel 60 inches overall it's just a monster it's a 10 pound unit altogether anyway you can see we've got a set screw here it came from the factory kind of loose but you know just remember always use the correct size uh, screwdriver okay make sure it fits all the way down in there use your hollow grinds right common stuff. Now I made a little, but you could use a brass punch. I would not use steel on this, this bright work and this nice wood. I'm just going to mar stuff up. Everyone's seen these guys, uh, these little, they sell them at every gun store. You can find them. They're super cheap. Uh, I took an old nast, nastier than this one and just cut it down and made myself a little nylon punch. So I don't have to worry about uh, messing any of this up and we'll just just a little tap, 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 peru. Off she comes. Looks like we've got a little divot there. I've got that piece of wood somewhere um, when I first was checking this thing out. When uh, the owner dropped it off with me, you can see that's what it should look like. And it's never been fired. That certainly doesn't look like it's ever been fired. So this might have just happen in, in manufacturing or something. But like I said, I've got that piece, so we'll see if we can get that uh, reattached. And then moving down to the next barrel band, you can see that this one, rather than a set screw, let me readjust here. Okay, so we're on to the next barrel band down. You can see there's the end. See, this is just, this is just manufacturing grease or something just to keep it nice and shiny. So don't worry about any of that. Uh, the next barrel band down doesn't have a set screw, but it does have sort of a little pinch bolt here. And this is your front of your sling swivel. And so we'll just loosen that up. That should loosen the band and uh, be nice and easy to take off. Oh, we need to change screwdriver size. All right, we've 
got the right size. Let's move this thing around. Boy, this is an awkward piece. My, I got a decent sized bench, but with a reloading press mounted to it on one side and a vise on the other, a five foot long rifle. Um, just trying to make sure I don't ding it up on anything. Okay, and that came loose like we figured. And just very gently work it off. You can see how this is a much, these are much easier pieces to maintain than those pins like we were talking about. You gotta do your, your uh, field stripping back then with everything being left in the bright. And I don't know if the ones back then were blued, but all the um, examples I can find have such heavy patina on them that I don't know if they came in the bright. Let me do a little more research. Now this one, we've got a, a spring holding this band in place. All right, so we'll just depress that. And off she comes, nice and easy. It just keeps coming. All right, that's better. I think there's gonna be a lot of camera adjusting going on. I just wanna, I know I harp on the, using the right screwdriver a lot. Um, you know, these screws are all perfect. This thing's never been apart probably since it was manufactured. So if you're a gunsmith or just uh, someone doing this yourself, you do not, you want to do everything you can to keep it looking nice. Why not, right? Even if it's just your bang around hunting rifle. Take care of it. Use the right tool. Screwdrivers are cheap, relatively, as far as tools go. All right, breech bolt. Now, our barrel should come right out. Just like that. You can see the Pedersoli markings, 17.5 millimeter, that's 69 caliber. And uh, the Etienne, same Etienne um, armory stamp. Very cool. Um, so here's your flash hole there. If you're not familiar with flint locks, that, uh, well, we'll talk about that later. But anyway, barrel's out. So we'll give this a good clean and uh, it'll break out the bore scope. So I was just setting up to do the uh, <laughs> the bore scope on this thing. I want to give some perspective of what a 69 caliber, just how big this actually is. There's a 22 long rifle. The whole thing could almost fit sideways into it. Here's a, what most of us would consider a monster. That's a 4570 with a 405 grain projectile. There's plenty of room in the bore for that thing. You could put the whole stuff, the whole round in there. And then how about this? 12 gauge shotgun shell slug almost fits down the bore, but that slug would drop right in there. 69 caliber monster. Imagine getting hit with a lead ball that big around as your finger, almost a thumb. Okay, here we go. Into the bore. Oh, this thing looks, it, this is unfired, pristine. We're just, uh, I'm gonna make my way through here until I mean, it's still got the machine marks from brand new. Well, the point we were looking at, you can see smooth bore, right? There's no riflings, just a, hollow tube that you shoot your lead ball down and you know this was designed before they discovered the benefits of spinning the projectile or maybe just a way to do it um, the rifle rifles are called rifles because of the rifling that was the designation between a rifle and a musket this being 
of course, a musket. Um, and with 44 and three quarter inch barrel, I'm just kind of ripping through here. You can see it's brand new. I don't expect to see much. Yeah, and here you can see that pin that I was talking about. That holds in the spring for your ramrod, which I can demonstrate here. See how that goes? It keeps the ramrod from falling out. Of course, it would be held also in place by the barrel bands around it. Um, we can drive that pin out, but I really don't see any reason to. I think I'll just leave it alone. Um, there's nothing nasty going on inside of there, and it looks brand new. So, yeah, we'll just leave that be. Now, as far as the barrel band spring, it looks to be pinned here. Um, I think I actually do want to drive this one out just... We'll see. Oh yeah, piece of cake. All right. Well, one thing I can tell you that I do not like about this is that I've already used three different widths. When I, a lot of times when I say size, I'm talking about the, the width of the blade of the screwdriver. And if you can find a detailed full teardown of a 1777 online you're a better researcher than I am um, so I'm kind of just using my logic to take a stab at the, the uh, order in which this thing should come apart keep your hand on this lock well I am because I assume 100% for sure these these cross bolts go through and screw into the lock but I don't know if there's anything else holding it on to the rifle probably not so with those out, I'm guessing the lock assembly should just come off. Okay, yep, sure enough. So just gently, you're gonna have to gently tap this thing out. Do not go crazy because when you do, you can tear out, you can see how the lock plate is coming out of the stock, right? If you go crazy and start prying or hammering this thing out, you'll tear out these beautiful cuts here, right? This inletting is very well done. We do not want to tear out the, uh, the grain. All right, I'm hanging up on something here. There we go. Cool. All right, well, we'll get this taken apart and cleaned up as well, but let's focus on the task at hand. So it looks like we've got pins. Boy, how am I gonna get that out? I'll tell you how. With an authentic French uh, 18th century picking device, that's how. Maybe. All right, well, I'm gonna marinate on this thing because the absolute, I would rather clean it up and leave it in there then fight it and mess up this stock. If it doesn't need to come out, I won't take it out, but um, I've got a pin right here and that might have something to do with it. But for now, this is gonna stay. Move on to the trigger guard. Let's see if I can get a good angle on this for you. Once again, we've got a different size screw head. That's fine. No big deal. I don't think you would probably need to get into this in the field, but I would think if you were a Frenchman and Emperor Bonaparte's infantry or fighting for your independence as a free American, you would not want to have to carry four different size screwdrivers on the battlefield. Hmm... We have a pin, we have another pin, that's that pin. Obviously the trigger is hinging on this guy, 
This is holding the front, so I think I gotta drive both of those out. We'll go this way. I will say all the pin sizes have been the same. see what's going on on the other side before we get too carried away oh yeah she's coming out just fine no tear out this is all part um, you know left a little rough because you can't see any of that anyway so um all right we'll just keep on driving Looking good. What I'm checking for is I want to make sure that this pin, which it's, if you can see, it's kind of convex, convex, yeah, domed. So it should push theoretically, but if it catches against any of these edges, and this is for all pins when you're driving them through wood or what have you, if it were to catch one of those, you, you can tear that grain out, and that sucks. Um, again, it would be hidden behind the lock, but we don't want to do any damage to this thing. Right, gunsmith's uh, first do no harm. Is that same as doctors? Gun doctors. All right. Well, problem now is I'm running out of punch. So let me see if I have a longer one. All right. Uh, these are 5 sixty-fourths punches, by the way. And while I don't have a longer standard punch, I do have a slightly longer roll pin punch. So, it shouldn't be a problem. My little nub will be fine. This is hardened steel. We're not hitting it very hard. So, another couple tappies. Hey. One pin expertly removed. Now what? Hey, look at that. So, that released pressure there. Pressure there. I think this is just holding the trigger in, but we can't be positive. Can't, can't be positive. It could be going through this is whole assembly it feels like it is well you know what it is the trigger itself let's see if i can show you this the trigger itself holds the trigger guard in so that pin does have to come out for sure for sure let's see i'm gonna go ahead and drive it that way as well see <clears throat> this is my rationale I can drive that pin in this way, and there's no way I'm going to tear out this wood, right? If there is a tear out, I would rather it happen inside the lock where it, or inside the inletting where it's covered by the lock. Yeah? Mm, makes sense to me. All right, here we go. This thing is blemish-free, this stock, and I am not going to be the first one to put a ding in it. So, we're covered up with tape. We have our pin. This might be a little excessive, but hey. Mark Novak would say, heavier hammer, light strikes. I just feel like I have more control with this little guy. Plus, I mean, come on. Huh? This isn't like a cute little joke-sized ball peen. And swap into our longer punch here. There we go. There we go. All right, so we've got a little bit of surface rust starting on the unpolished part. This is a cast piece, but it looks like a very good casting, like a tight, tiny little grain structure. So that looks cool. I'm no metallurgist, but I've seen some cast parts. Um, so we will go ahead and clean that up. And uh, 
Let's see here. Do you come out? It for sure does. Oh, there's the trigger, by the way. This thing's got a nice trigger pull. Um, I don't think there's any reason to mess with that trigger at all. There we go. So just a little bit of rust and casting um, kind of had that bound up inside there. So we will take care of that. How am I going to get you? This is going to keep me awake at night if I can't get this piece out of here. If I go, if I work too hard at getting this out, I will tear this out. I will tear this wood out. Especially there, it looks like the wood is actually overlapping the metal right there. So what happens when you get this thing out? Does it bring that wood with it? Now it's jacked and you can't fix it? Or do I just clean it up and leave it in there? I think I'm just gonna, I think I'm gonna put pride aside and I'm just gonna clean this up, leave it in the stock. No reason to remove it. Uh, another question. Should I remove the uh, butt plate? God, that's so seamlessly done. Petter Sollies are excellent. Maybe I'll pull it apart and see if there's any rust underneath. Yeah. Actually, yeah, let's take it off. Screwdriver size number four. I've had comments on some of these videos. Do you feel the need to talk the whole entire time? You just want to watch me take a gun apart in dead silence. That's awkward for all of us. I see a lot of people doing <laughs> ASMR gun videos. Hey, man. More power to you. Ah, look at that. So... Yeah, good thing we got that apart, which makes me want to take that side plate off even more, but whatever. So this little spot rust under here, we will get that cleaned up as well. So there's the natural color of this wood. Pretty dark still. Just beautiful wood. David Petersoli. These guys are definitely masters at what they do. All right, so this is our little piece that was broken off of the stock. You can see right there. And it's obvious that that happened because the uh, barrel band has a set screw, holds it in place, and it's a sharp little guy. So, my question is, how do I fix this without it just happening again? So I think the best bet, um, we're going to use some pro bed, right? This is uh, for bedding, bedding a rifle into a stock, and it'll be brown. It won't be so obvious, and it's pretty tough. Um, so we'll get that in there, and I'll mix up just a teeny little bit, get it in, hold it in place with some tape or a rubber band or something. All right, I got a little uh, resin mixed up here. We can see I've just put way more than we need. We're going to have some squeeze out. No big deal. This is a well-oiled stock, so it shouldn't stick to it. Long as we clean up the excess. All right, now this teeny tiny little piece. Something like that. All right. Let's get our little rubber band on here. I think that's about as good as we're going to get as far as clamping goes. Of course, it's right on the edge and it wants to come off. Okay. 
All right, let me just let that cure. All right, well, I got all the bright work cleaned up. And uh, on the back sides, there was a little spot, right? I mean, it was nothing. It's not even pitting. Uh, I think this uh, replica, I believe, was early 2000s. There's this, the butt plate was the worst. It all just came right off. I used some uh, Hoppy's, regular Hoppy solvent. And on the parts that can't be seen, I used some four out steel wool. Don't use that on, on the parts of the bright work that can be seen. I like these, with some like generic 3M scotch Bright pad knockoff, but the white ones are super, um, they're still abrasive, they're good for polishing, but they won't take off finish. So, so I wanted to show you that, and then uh, I still have to do the barrel. You can see kind of what I'm talking about here. It's a, it's some kind of slime, some sort of grease compound. It just wipes right off. So with some a little bit of solvent, it comes right off. And then I did find the worst of the rust, funny enough, happened to be Where'd it go? Right there. You know, it's, it's barely anything, but it might be through the polish. I think I can polish it out though. This is on the ramrod. Um, for whatever reason, you know, that could just be one spot that didn't get any protectant on it, but it's pretty much all the way around and it's just right there. So we'll get that taken care of, no big deal, and have it looking good as new. All right, so we got that rust off of there. It's all shined up, looking good. You can, it's hard to see on the camera, but there's there's some scratches that run. You can kind of see it there. These linear scratches that run the length of the guide rod, you're not gonna be able to do anything about that. It just, that is part, I mean, it's part and partially using the, the weapon. It, it As you slide the guide rod, or I mean the uh, ram rod in and out of the barrel bands where it's held into place and down here where the spring is clasping onto it, it's just gonna scratch. Um, it's no big deal, they're not deep. And it's, uh, I happen to know the guy that bought this thing, bought it to use it. So, um, no big deal. All right, well, there's the barrel all shined up. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, there's a couple spots that are scuffed up down here you can really see it um that's where the barrel band makes contact it's just cost of doing business um you are not going to get it that's that's just nasty from uh it's just leftover solvent on there but anyway um, you know, well, you can't really do anything. There's no point to, because the barrel band is in contact with that anyway. Uh, just, if you're taking it off and putting it on, just be careful. You don't want to scratch the top part, you know, visible parts of it that aren't covered by the band. David Petersoli, right there. Wow, cool. Anyway, uh, I think we are good to just start tearing this apart. We'll start here with the lock or maybe that piece this all needs clean so it's all got to come apart and there's just no two ways about it we got another flat spring over here so let's see we'll start on this side no we'll start we'll start here with the main spring you can see I'm just gonna use a regular old shop towel um, and my little vice grips get this thing to loosen it up a touch. There you go. All right. Now we've got the spring tension, and you can see that spring is moving loose in there. All the tension is here um, on that vice grip. So now we can fully remove our spring. Uh, our mainspring. All right, so next, 
we'll work on this flat spring. I wanna adjust these to where they close just a little bit smaller than that spring's currently sitting. Right about there. Of course, oh, see, it popped off. So get it where you want it. I didn't leave myself room to get to the to the screw. So get it where you want it, pinch it, and then we can get in there with the screwdriver. Okay, and again, we're just gonna set that aside. Hopefully it doesn't sprung off into orbit, pop out of there so you can see all this kind of nasty uh, lubricant that they had in there. We'll get that out of there, replace it with some fresh grease and a real thin layer. From there, uh, we've got one more spring, but this one I don't think we're gonna have to worry as much about. Tension-wise, it's pretty small. It shouldn't be too, too much pressure on that guy. And she comes right out. Okay, I'm just keeping the screws with the springs. Now that we've got no more spring tension in there, the rest of this should come out fairly easily. They did not scrimp on the assembly loop when they put this thing together. And in honest, all honesty, you could probably have run it just how it was, but um, it's such a, a pretty piece that, you know, the owner and I both figured, let's take this thing apart and, uh, and get it looking good. Grease doesn't necessarily go bad. I mean, it kind of goes bad, but if this thing was put together 20 years ago, um, that's a lot of sitting around collecting dust. You will notice like if you've ever seen like a bicycle or motorcycle chain or I don't know, it's just any, your, your gun itself. Anytime you lubricate it, it's kind of a twofold, um, or let's say it's, it's a sort of a double-edged sword, right? You are lubricating and protecting, but oil and grease tends to collect dirt and grime right? Dirt and dust will sit and stick to it. So over the years, all the little dust and everything that seems to just somehow miraculously find its way into the tightest places, uh, it builds up and you end up with situations like this. Uh, and the last but not least is the hammer itself. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to use this screwdriver. Again, it's the proper width or thickness, we'll say. Yeah, that's a little better. Um, but I'd like to have one that's the full width of the uh, slot, but, you know, I don't have a half-inch wide screwdriver. Okay. All right, so we're going to leave the hammer on the lock plate with a tumbler in it because <clears throat> you can see the way that the hammer is attached. The lock plate, or the, sorry, the tumbler is driven into the hammer. And most likely, the way they did this, um, it's in there tight. And most likely, the way they did this is that they probably uh, heated the hammer and, you know, threw the tumbler into a freezer or something like that. When you do that, the cold part will shrink by a couple hundreds of thousands, right? And the hot part will expand by a couple hundreds of thousands. It opens up the whole and shrinks down the uh, penetrating part. This, you, if you've ever done bearings in the bottom end of a dirt bike or something like that, this is a trick they use to get a bearing to slide into a, a bearing race, into uh, the housing. So once it's in there and the temperatures stabilize or normalize, um, it's in there pinch and tight. So we could probably drive this thing out, but I would have to use some heat and I do not want to do that. It, looking down inside of here with a flashlight it looks like there's no uh there's really no corrosion or anything in there to speak of so let's see if you can see that 
hard to see. Trust me. Um, so I'll just clean up the plate and we'll clean up all these parts here and we'll put it all back together. All right, well, let's put our lock back together. Um, I'm gonna start with the frizzen. You can see how that fits in there. And then the shortest screw. There's a few different uh, screws and I kind of had to go back and look at my own video of taking it apart to see, make sure I was doing it right, putting it back together. Uh, also, I'm not gonna tighten everything up till it's all together. Um, but all these screws are just a little bit different lengths. I think they did that on purpose because all the screws should fit flush with the uh, lock plate, all the ones that are coming from inside out anyway. And that makes it pretty obvious to know if you're using the wrong one. So it's a pretty clever design and I'm sure that that is part of the original design. And again, I'm not going to torque everything down until I get it all more or less put together. So there's our frizzen and frizzen cap cover in place. You can see what I mean. All these screws are gonna sit like that. They're just not, it just looks clean. You know, it's pretty obvious to tell if you've got the wrong one in. Let's see, we'll move on to the sear and bridle. You can see these two separate pieces. You've got your screws here. Here, I'll just show you. Right, the shorter one goes to the front of the bridle and this hole goes over your tumbler, this piece sticking out of your tumbler here. Pops right on like that. And then we'll get the first screw started and then sear in there. You can see where the sear should fit into the bridle. The screw goes in there. Hang on. There we go. Once again, we'll just snug them up. Back that off a little. Okay, we see sear engagement, pull the trigger. If the hammer were back, so you've got your half cock position there, you're all the way forward at that point, half cock there and full cock there. And if I put pressure on the hammer, our trigger will push up and release it. It's pretty simple, but pretty ingenious. Um, next, so we're gonna want to put our spring, get it a little higher there. Actually, before I do this, let me show you. There's this little tab sticking out right there. And that is gonna go into this slot, you see? So, so like I said, we'll put the tab into the little slot here. We'll get that screw going. Tough to do without covering up for the camera. There you go. Now this one I am actually going to tighten down because the last thing I want is for that spring to pop out of place. And that's our trigger spring. Keeps it in place. All right, next. It's going to be our main spring. Um, same thing, just a little bit more difficult. The best way to do that is to uh, get your hammer in the fully forward position. and gives you the most space to work with. The end of your spring needs to go on top of your tumbler. And you'll see that this 
piece sticking out right here, this tab needs to go into here. Now, when you're looking at your lock plate, in order to, same thing with, with up here, well, this one you have the little slot, but here you can see one of these holes is not threaded. Okay, I'm not sure if we can pick that up on camera, but you've got a threaded hole, threaded hole. These are threaded, this one is not. It's not threaded because that is where this tab goes. All right, just like so. And you can see here, the spring just simply will not go. I don't care who you are. I mean, you could probably He-Man that thing up over there, but you run the risk of breaking stuff and it's just not a good idea. Just take a second. Okay, pad this thing up just like we did before. And we're gonna have to open these up a little more. Okay, now we've got that spring pinched flat. Put it right in there. And let's just go ahead and get that screw. Um, get it in there, get it snug down. Don't get in a hurry. I'm talking to myself as much as I am anyone who's maybe watching. I've definitely gotten in a hurry and gotten frustrated more times than I care to admit. And I've broken uh, broken some parts. Thankfully, only on my own guns. So, all right, let's check here. We've got half cock. full cock and then we can release our trigger cool so you want to get those aligned just right and then we will uh screw this guy in okay this is going to be a little loose because it uh typically is going to have it's gonna be sandwiching that leather in the flint, right? So with it empty, it's okay. If it's a little wobbly, that's fine. We don't need to bottom this screw out, tighten it down too crazy. Also, we've got this guy uh, to cover up where the tumbler goes into the hammer. So let's get him going. And use the right size bit we don't need to reef on it just a good good little torque okay now we can go through well, I'm gonna go back to this guy the gun of many bits many screwdriver sizes we're gonna go ahead now you don't want to torque this down too hard because if you over torque it, just like this, you can't get your frizzen opened up, right? This acts like a pinch bolt. So let's back it back about an eighth turn. Just, how about that? There we go, okay. So this fellow's gonna go in just like that again. We've got our little nubbin sticking out that goes into this guy, which is not threaded. Our little impromptu soft jaws. And let's pinch this spring down. This one doesn't take much. That goes like so. And then this is going to be that. I've had this musket for two months now, probably more, maybe. I, I can't even remember. And it's been sitting up in my closet. And I've been dragging my feet on starting this project because it's just, it's such a nice piece. And, you know, I, I say it all the time, I'm, I'm not a gunsmith, I'm just a dude. I'm an amateur gunsmith, let's say that, right? I do work on my own guns, and I do work on guns for friends. Um, but I don't get paid to do it. I'm not an actual professional. And so, even though 
I'd like to think I'm decent at it. I just doubt myself sometimes. I don't want to be the one to mess up this beautiful piece. I mean, look at it. So it's a work of art. But at some point, you just got to jump in and go for it, right? Yeah. Seems to be on there. All right. Well, we're ready to put the trigger guard back on. So if you remember, this goes here. All right. And you have a screw in the back that holds that on. The other part is actually held on by this trigger, which has the slightly longer of the two pins. So this guy right here. I want to line that up. It's going to be hard for you to see in the camera, but we're lining up this hole in the trigger uh, with this hole that goes through the stock. Okay, it's in, and let me tell you, in the end, it was much easier driving the pin through this side. I was super worried about damaging the wood, but... You know, uh, I actually got the pin started on this side and then turned the uh, musket upside down, got this pin into uh, the hole here, right? Until it was holding, it was going through the hole in the trigger. And then held that in place and just tap, tap, tapped it through until it pushed the punch out. I'm sure a real gunsmith is going, yeah, duh, that's how it's done. Well, you know, got to figure stuff out sometimes. So, let's turn this guy back around. And I am going to place my punch very, very carefully on top of there. And give it one last little, there we go. Perfecto. All right, now the uh, actual trigger guard itself has this little hook and remember it hooks into this slot here and so which way does it go? This way or this way? Ah, that way. Okay. All right, well, I got it. What did I have to do? What was happening was this piece of trigger guard right here was acting like a spring, okay? This, um, which would be your sling mount, right? It goes in and it pinches this trigger guard down and you drive the pin through and that holds it. Well, I could get the pin started, but there was enough spring pressure from this uh, trigger guard to where it was misaligning the pin and it just didn't want to go solution i took a rag and uh quadrupled it up put it over there and then uh got these big uh c-clamp vice grips and i'm talking minimum pressure to get it like that's all it took to get it tight just barely barely and that was enough to uh, take that spring pressure off and allow me to just, you know, tap that pin right through. The, so let's get a little creative. Don't force. There's always a solution. Well, I think from here, um, now that we've got our trigger group in, let's go ahead and put our lock back in there. Um, and then we will go ahead Lock bolts. Okay. Okay. We do not need to reef these down. The last thing you want to do is smash all of this together, but all right, good and snug. My OCD is not going to let me leave that screw like that. There we go. It's like they're matching now. And then... The business. 
the business end goes in. Such an incredibly awkwardly long barrel. I think I want the paratrooper version of the uh, 1777. This guy. Love it, love it, love it. Okay, now remember this. Remember our cool little spring guy? We'll put him in there. And then our first barrel band goes on. This is a square cut, right? So as we put our barrel band on, you can tell. It has to go this way with this piece forward because the square cut goes against. So I don't know how you can do this without scratching your barrel. So I'd say the less amount of times you can take this thing apart, the better. It just it has to fit tight in order to do its job. So it kind of is what it is. Just going as gentle as I can not to scratch anything. Okay. Let's uh, cinch him down. Is that the right screwdriver? Sure is. Okay. And last but not least, so this is, remember our repair job we did here. Um, I am going to leave this up to the owner, how tight he wants to snug this down. Um, I would recommend going pretty easy on it. snug that up just enough to keep the band from coming off and he tells me he's got a bayonet for this thing which as I recall is like close to three foot long which would put this thing overall eight feet long <laughs> so that's kind of insane oh let's not forget the butt cap gotta have that Back you out a little. There we go. We need the big screwdriver here. Is it that guy? Yep. Okay. Quality product. Poor craftsman that blames his tools. I've heard. Meaning, it's not the tool's fault I suck at this. All right. Well, guys. Oh, let's not forget to tighten this down. Okay, that really is it. Put our cleaning rod back in here. And that is all she wrote. All right, guys, and that's it. Um, one detailed strip, inspect and clean, lubed and 
reassembled 1777 French Charleville pattern musket. Pretty cool if you ask me. Thanks for watching.